All right, I think it's time for me to start here. Hey everyone, welcome. Um, thanks for being here today. I'm doing a talk on online privacy and risk management. And let me just pull, press play here. So let's get right into it. All right, let me introduce myself. So my name is Ritu Gill. I'm an open source intelligence analyst with 14 years with the Canadian government specifically with law enforcement. 12 of those years, I was with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Canada's national police force. I am an OSINT enthusiast. Um, you can find me online on Twitter where I go by the handle OSINT Techniques. Um, I'm also an advisory member of OSINT Curious, which is a group of some you know, amazing uh, OSINT people. Uh, I work with many other um, great OSINT people uh, teaching those um, who want to learn about open source intelligence. Uh, we post blogs, 10 minute tips and other content um, for those that want to advance their OSINT skills. I also have a website, uh, OSINT Techniques, and I started writing courses uh, for verified investigators on cyber training. So what are we going to talk about today? The agenda today is to talk about some basics like definitions of OSINT, OPSEC, threat modeling, might have heard some of these terms before. I will go over examples of how people compromise themselves online. And then I'm going to discuss ways that say you can stay secure and I'm going to share some resources that could also help with discovering your online footprint and then find ways that you can remove some of this information. So open source intelligence, it's a process of collecting, evaluating and analyzing publicly available information with the goal of answering a specific intelligence question. So this is my full time job and how it fits in with privacy, you might wonder, well, if people did a better job of managing their online footprint, it would make my heart, my job a lot harder. Uh, it would make it really difficult. And so let's talk about OPSEC. What is OPSEC? It stands for operational security. And the objective of OPSEC is to prevent sensitive data uh, falling into the wrong hands. Okay. So we first want to identify that data that can be compromised. And then we want to take the steps to reduce the exploitation of that data. So think about it like this. A bad actor um, could use information you're sharing online and do something nefarious, um, like break into your house while you're on vacation because maybe you shared uh, photos with your family saying that, hey, you're all away from the house, so it's empty. So some questions to think about. Um, and let's start here is what can an adversary or a bad actor gain from looking at your online footprint? Where do you expose yourself too much online? Um, how can you minimize those risks? These questions will help make your assessment. For you, having better OPSEC might, might mean preventing somebody with bad intentions, um, from identifying you online or knowing where you live or work. Sometimes you don't want that information known, but there are some of you that need to take it like another step further and you need more protection because of the type of work you do, okay? So a threat model. I talked about some of these basic terminology, some of these terms. A threat model is a method of evaluating security and privacy risks in order to mitigate them, that's the point. Everyone's threat model will look different and there are different levels of threat models, okay? So some may only need to do basics like password protect devices, use, use strong passwords, use two-factor authentication, where some of you might need to take it a step further and actively remove some of that public data from the internet. So you might be thinking, well, okay, um, how do I figure this out? Well, to figure out what your threat model is, you want to find the answers to questions such as what information do you want to protect? So your house address, your work location, 
family members, your assets. These are things we typically want to protect. What are you doing now um, online? Or what are you doing now that exposes you online? Do you have privacy settings on all your social media? What do you post online? And then who might want to gain access to this information? This can be in the form of people you don't know who are looking for a soft target. For example, this can be in the form of, say, you apply to a job and a recruiter searches for your name on social media to see what you post, to get an idea about your character, right? It could be simple as that, somebody wanting to get information about you. So from there, you would conduct an assessment like this. It's a good reminder of how your online activity can impact you. You may move into a job where you need to reassess your threat model. That's why it's important to think about this often and reassess as necessary. And one thing I always like to point out here is risk factors. It, definitely you are a risk factor and what you do online, but also family members, friends, colleagues, they can inadvertently expose you online. Some of, you, some of you might be thinking, well, what are you talking about? Okay, well, I'm an OSINT analyst, as I've mentioned, and I search and find information about people all the time. There's an incredible amount of information people post online that gets used. Um, and to give you an idea of what I need to start with, well, here's a list. So these are the things you want to protect, okay? Um, all these things allow me to find out more about you. So whether it's your name or a username, your email addresses, employment information, I call these digital breadcrumbs. And they help build a pro they help build a profile on a person or a business or whatever it is. Um, at the end of the day, the more private someone is, the harder it is to OSINT. Okay. The harder it is to find that publicly available information. So remember, these are things you want to protect. And yes, some people make it really easy. So this post caught my eye. This person made it so easy to find information about him uh, on Facebook, posted his current workplace, his job, his past uh, job where he lived, um, where he was from. He had even had a, he tagged um, something on Facebook that said his name. So let's just say his name was John. And it said John's house and it had a location. Uh, and so that was probably his house address, which was really not great to post. Um, furthermore, he had notes posted where he had tagged his um, mom, his girlfriend, in general, just too much information. Um, and of course, this post caught my eye because, you know, he evaded police and I was like, oh, interesting. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, no privacy settings, right? Uh, the reason I'm showing you these examples are their takeaways for us, people like us, right? We can learn from other people's mistakes. And then you see ones like this. It's a Facebook group. Somebody finds a driver's license and they post it. And I've purposely blacked out a lot of blurred out the images and stuff. Um, so I don't further expose that person, but this is not a good idea. Uh, that's poor offsec, as written on that slide. That's what I, I, I wrote there. I drew that on there. Um, it's just that wasn't necessary to post somebody's driver's license on an uh, open Facebook group. Not, not great, right? Too much personal information. But again, people aren't always thinking about these things. Let's look at an example of um, something I just call leaky documents, where some people might not realize their Google Drive is not always secure. So using a Google search here and a site operator, that's what I've done in this example, you can look for resumes on Google Drives. These types of documents are sensitive as they contain so much personal information. It can include your home address, right? Phone numbers, emails, employment information, um, and more. So this is a good reminder to ensure your settings are secure on the platforms you use, not just Google Drive, but in general, but ensure your Google Drive is locked down, um, but always check your privacy settings. I posted a link on this slide uh, for those of you that wanna learn more about search operators, um, how to narrow down your search when you're using uh, search engines, because that's a 
uh, that's a really help, helpful um, uh, skill set to have um, to find the results you're looking for. All right, this one. So from the OSINT mindset, barcodes can provide us with important information. Some people don't realize that barcodes contain personal data, or they can, right? For example, people on social media love posting their boarding passes, okay? Um, so in this example, number one, I was looking at someone's Instagram post from post of their boarding pass, uh, which they posted with a hashtag boarding pass. So that's a thing. Some of these hashtags, they just, um, they're again, great for finding information, but really poor OPSEC. Um, there, this person was using an alias on their Instagram account. So I didn't really know their real name. I was like, oh, okay. And it wasn't actually a name. Um, it was, uh, just some sort of, some sort of username, um, not related to the person, I guess. Um, and when they posted their boarding pass, they covered their name with their thumb, which is shown in, uh, in the image too. Obviously I've had to crop it out and all that kind of stuff. Um, they obviously didn't realize that there are our online barcode readers where you know people can use which is say number three that screenshot um that will scan a barcode and tell you if there's any data in there and so i did because you know i'm an osin and a privacy person and i'm always curious what people are doing online um i took the barcode entered it into the barcode reader and in image four is the result so it revealed this person's first name, their last name, the departing airport, the destination airport, what airline it was, flight number. Um, sometimes it will even give you like their frequent flyer points, uh, their number or whatever axis. Um, you might think, so what? Well, hackers are known to look for this information and they can hijack accounts. Moreover, they can gain more personal information about that person. So this is just a small example to show you that even barcodes can expose you um, in different ways online. Here's an example of how people inadvertently leak information about themselves. So social engineering questions. You've probably seen them on social media. Uh, these questions people keep answering. They're a prime example of oversharing sensitive data online. And Sometimes some of the questions are not too big of a deal, but then there's questions and you'll see on the right screenshot here uh, where people provide too much information. So where someone, somebody could use these answers to guess security questions. So like, hey, what are your siblings names? What's your favorite song? Um, it, it can go on and on, right? So not all these would uh, maybe um, fall into, you know, trying to access somebody's account, but there are several, right? Sometimes What's your favorite color? What's your favorite band? Important, important dates, um, even, you know, uh, to do with schedules or when that person is. This is just poor privacy when you're, you know, answering these questions. And then people will repost them and then other people will answer. So most people know not to post pictures or credit cards or pictures of their credit cards or disclose sensitive information online. But a surprising number of people will post their phone numbers and home addresses on social media. It's shocking. I see it all the time. So again, you might ask, what's the risk? Well, somebody guessing passwords, uh, social engineering attacks against you, maybe physical harm, etc. So the takeaway on this slide is pretty much what you see on the left screenshot. Stop giving people your personal info to guess your password and security questions. Bad idea. Don't do it. So you're probably thinking, wow, okay, it doesn't stop. So no, it doesn't end there, there's more. The past couple of years have been terrible for oversharing. People posting uh, their vaccine cards, it can tell a lot about somebody. And I just use this one as an example, regardless of what kind of card it is, but this is kind of more, I guess, in a recent thing. Uh, depending on what your vaccine cards say, if you, if you are vaccinated, what it says, it could include your date of birth, it could tell you about somebody in terms of what city or what country, where they're from, um, your name, and depending again where you're from, how much uh, there could be a lot of information exposed. Not only that, 
there was a huge issue with people doing counterfeit and that kind of stuff, but you're making it really easy by posting that uh, card there to just uh, grab a screenshot and go from there. The second example, packages. So people, again, uh, we love shopping. We love our Amazon, all that kind of stuff. Um, but a lot of people get the boxes, they throw them out, throw them in recycling or wherever they put them um, with their addresses and their names on these boxes. Again, I mean, people are dumpster diving, whatever. People might be looking for, hey, I need an address and a name. Well, just go in the recycling bin if you are if you live in one of those buildings, uh, one of the shared buildings, that kind of thing. Third example. In this third example, a male was seen wearing his work uh, badge when he stormed the Capitol uh, last January. So again, and I, I believe from the news article, he was fired. But again, why would you do that? Why would you do either? And then we have um, things like, I just call it sketchy text messages. You'll, you likely have experienced those phishing text messages uh, where they want you to click on a link. In this example, I received a text message where there was an IP address noted and a mention of a Netflix uh, account. So when I searched that IP in urlscan.io, it was tagged as malicious activity so there was a huge red flag right there um not that i would have clicked on it but i just wanted to know what it said um also i don't have a netflix account in my name so i knew that was a phishing text on top of it so the takeaway first thing don't click on unknown links or addresses via text or email uh, a good website to check for malicious content including searching for websites or ips uh, is urlscan.io the one i showed in this screenshot Okay, so I know this example, um, it's not about online privacy, but I felt it was still important enough as a reminder, because a lot of people will post about these same things on social media posts. So not only that, uh, but what you have to remember that what you put on your say vehicles, they can impact your physical, physical security as well. So car stickers can give away a lot of personal information. So whether you're driving through town or your car's parked at your residence, think about what you're advertising, okay? So about your kids, what activities they're involved in, expensive toys, say you have in your garage, um, if you have a pet, their name, where you live, work, where your kids go to school, that kind of stuff. Again, anybody can easily become a target for different reasons, but these are things to think about. And I'm not trying to get people to be paranoid, but I think it's important to uh, care about your privacy. So be mindful of what's in the back of your photos, you know, whether you're on a video conference call. That way you just have more control of what you expose. Okay. So these are some tips just when you're sharing content, what you want to think about. Privacy settings don't always work on all platforms. Facebook, for example, is leaky. Privacy settings on Facebook are not black and white, okay? And I'm telling you that from experience, years of experience uh, using Facebook um, for investigations. Before posting, you want to ask yourself, if what you posted was leaked, would it compromise, say, your location, if it mattered, uh, your family? And then proceed with your actions. Before I post anything on social media, privacy settings or not, I ask myself this question, and then I proceed. I consider all my social media interactions as public, even if I have a private social media account. Um, I always think of it as, uh, you know, if it gets out in the public, is this going to be an issue for me? Um, also, I consider, and you should consider what you post as permanent because whether you're using Snapchat, Instagram, whatever platform you like, people take screenshots. So even though something might disappear after whatever seconds or, you know, after so many days or, or whatnot, there still could be a record of it. It's easy to overshare online and overlook the risks. Um, but a question to think about is what might a fraudster do with this information? And the last thing I wanna say is remember that everything that you're posting online is building your digital footprint. That's really important to remember. <coughs> Sorry, uh, so some basic tips. So what can you do to protect yourself? Um, 
these are some general tips that you can start with for better online privacy and security. You can use strong passwords. You know, using strong passwords at Password Manager is a start, but also think about your browsing habits and, you know, using maybe a secure search engine like DuckDuckGo or StartPage.com that don't save and collect your personal information. Um, and the next few slides are about your searching habits. So to get a complete list, um, you can scan this QR code. I know that sounds super sketchy for a privacy talk, um, but don't randomly scan QR codes because they can contain, like on the street, I wouldn't just go around scanning these codes because they can contain malicious content. This one is just a link to my website because I didn't want to put all the tips on the side. They didn't fit. Um, it just links to osinttechniques.com, um, and that's all that is. Uh, other things you want to think about, though, is, you know, don't leave your devices unintended when you, you know, go to a coffee shop. Do you just walk away? Um, you know, do you lock your screen um, when you walk away? Do you use webcam covers? Do you use a privacy filter? Sometimes um, it's important for some of those, some of us to care about that kind of stuff. So let's talk about search engines like Google Chrome that save a lot of information about us. And I one thing I do notice is there's a lot of confusion about what incognito mode is. Um, using incognito mode doesn't really protect you. It won't save information on the computer that you're using, but your ISP, your internet service provider, and other websites can still see your searches. So for me, it's I'll use incognito when I'm using somebody else's machine. You know, you're over and you need to borrow somebody. I, I would be like, okay, I'm going to use incognito. That's when I would use it. This prevents your history and what you search and the cookies from being saved on that particular device. That's all it does. So what else? Um, browser fin fingerprinting, I want to mention this. It's a technique used to identify people based on their device settings. Your browser always divulges some information to websites you visit such as, hey, the browser you're using, operating system, the exact version of, say, the browser, so whether you've le left it un, um, not updated, that kind of thing. If you want to see what your browser fingerprint looks like, you can use one or a couple of the following free services. Um, cover your tracks.eff.org or, say, miunique.org. You can find out say, you know, see what they see, the, the, your IP, the type of browser, that kind of see. It's interesting to see what you look like when you look at websites, especially if you're looking at like personal websites that somebody might be monitoring. Um, I look at it from the perspective of if I'm investigating or researching someone's website, I would like to cover up who I actually am versus who I want them to think I am. Um, so some of these websites, again, they give you the insight into how Identify, identifiable you are to sites and people. Um, and sometimes it's worth to do a comparison, like I'll pick a couple just to see what uh, the, the different sites say about you. Um, again, after using some of these sites, you might say, well, what can I do to maybe fix this or change this? Okay, this is an example from miunique.org. Um, so again, It'll help you understand what's collected about you when you visit a site. And you'll see the, the higher the similarity percentage, um, the better for you because you blend in. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but you can give this a try and, and see how it works for you. Um, another site that I don't think I have on this slide or on the last slide was um, is deviceinfo.me. So deviceinfo.me. That's another site that also does something very similar. So some browser extensions that you can use to adjust your privacy settings. There's many, but I'll cover these three quickly. Um, there's HTTPS everywhere. So they this will encrypt your communication with many major websites. So it'll make your browsing more secure. It will switch a site from being insecure, so the HTTP to secure. So that's HT, um, HT TPS, the S being for secure. Privacy Badger, it will block advertisers and third party trackers from secretly tracking where you go and what pages you visit. So that's another good one. And then we have something different um, user agent switcher. 
This extension changes the user agent, which is something that identifies what browsers, browser you're using. So you can, you know, and what version and what operating system. So with this add-on, it helps you change your browser and your operating system footprint. Um, I, could be, I could be using an iOS device uh, on Chrome, but spoof these details with this extension. That's what it does. All right, so let's see here. What else can you do to secure yourself? What are some solutions? Simply security by absence, okay? Not posting the information out there in the first place. You can't get hacked through what you don't have, you know, through the services apps that you don't actually have. This is a good reminder that if you stop using certain apps, sites, or whatever it is, you want to make sure you delete them. Don't just say, hey, I'm, I'm off and just leave it there because that information still can be used by people. This is part of cleaning up your digital footprint. I've conducted security assessments where I often will find a user's old accounts. They never deleted, but they're like, oh, I stopped using it. Um, but they contain a lot of uh, information such as photos, um, associations to people and all that kind of stuff. That's why you, you wanna care about that. Disinformation, there's another technique. It's called disinformation where you plant some fake information to mix up your digital footprint. You can create fake accounts, especially if you do have a unique name maybe. If you have a common name like mine, it is common. People sometimes are confused by that, but it is common. Um, it helps me kind of hide in some ways. But if your name isn't common, you'll have to put in more effort. And disinformation is one of those techniques. Say, for example, you search your name and you find information, false information about yourself out there. Perhaps leave it there. That's what I would do, right? Um, I wouldn't try to correct it, maybe. Um, the goal is to make attribution to your name difficult. Educating those people around you. This is really important. Letting people know how they might be compromising their privacy and security and why it matters. There's a cool little video here um, which shows, it's called Data to Go, and some of you may have already seen it. It shows how easy it is to obtain information about people online. It's a quick uh, few minute video. Um, but again, it's uh, you can, if you don't feel comfortable with visiting the tiny URL I created, I created that. Um, you can just go into YouTube and enter um, Data to Go uh, and check it out. What else can you do? There's so much you can do. Data breaches, they're constant. Have you checked if your accounts have been a part of a data breach? Troy Hunt has a website called Have I Been Pwned where you can search for emails and phone numbers to see if they're associated with breaches. So go run your own and see if you were part of a breach. This uh, service all, uh, also allows you to sign up for notifications. So any future breaches, you'll be notified. If you find you've been in a breach, make sure you go change your password. You might want to even go delete the account altogether in some situations. It's all about minimizing the data out there about us. Some useful websites, I'm not going to go into details here as I'm, I'm getting close to my time. Um, but these are some resources and I've explained what they do. Uh, another one that's not on this is called um, privacytests.org. It's a web browser uh, privacy. It's a comparison, essentially. But you can go through these different sites, allow you to do different things. They're just um, some resources for you. And there's an exercise you can do. Number one tip is that majority of OSINT people start with OSINT or a search engine. So try searching your data on Google and Bing and find ways you can remove this information, you know, through the contact information on a website if it's there. This is one of the easiest ways uh, to see what your digital footprint looks like. So start with what you use, your name, your usernames, your emails, search your home address and quotes, use quotes around your name, um, add a location. So, you know, uh, whatever area you're from. And also think of search engines as that low hanging fruit. Next, the next thing you want to think about is those manual searches when you're into social media. Go go see what those look like as well. And again, some more resources here. Um, if you do come across things, there's a couple of resources here. Uh, I have there's one from Michael Bazell, the first one. Um, another one from Mike Micah Hoffman, who's web breacher on Twitter, and Josh Josh Huff, who's learn all the things on Twitter. They provide a bunch of useful tips to clean up your digital footprint. 
Um, I understand there will be challenges depending on what country you're from, like the United States, where they don't, um, they have a lot of public information about their citizens. So it, it's more of a challenge, but it's still possible. And for those of you that like documentaries and that kind of stuff, um, this was or is available on Netflix. Um, the Social Dilemma is a good awareness film, and it shows the many ways social media platforms influence society. Um, it's also interesting that a lot of the former, uh, a lot of the people they interviewed were former employees of Facebook, Google, and whatnot. All right, final thoughts. Okay, so remember threat actors can use information to their advantage and we need to do better to protect ourselves. Don't be a soft target by exposing too much personal information or details about your life online. And this last one here. So here's a recap of my presentation, which I will post on Twitter. If you guys are interested, I hope you uh, enjoyed my presentation and learned a few things. Here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out um, on Twitter or you can email me as well um, at this email address. And that's my presentation. Any questions?